If it's Wednesday, it's time once again for Flashpoints with our national security analyst, Juan Zarate, who joins me here at the desk. Juan, again, another uh, busy menu today, and you're starting with the moratorium on settlements in the Middle East. Yeah, the peace process is on the brink of collapse, in part because the Israelis have lifted the moratorium, the, the freeze on settlement construction, which had been in some ways a precondition for the face-to-face -face talks and which the Palestinians and, frankly, the Americans had made a central issue in terms of building trust between the parties. The good news here, Bob, is that uh, Abu Abbas, the, the leader of the Palestinians, uh, hasn't broken off talks officially yet. He's taking time to reflect. He's taking counsel from the Americans and others not to walk away from the table. Uh, and he's going to consult with the Arab League uh, to determine what steps should be taken. But I think you know, the real problem here lies in the fact that the settlements were made a very public and central issue early on by the Obama administration, around which then the Palestinians had to rally and negotiate uh, with. And so uh, we're on the brink because the settlement issue has been made a central uh, starting point uh, for the talks. Made negotiations very, very difficult. Some people would say even impossible. I think that's right. And, and what you have now is the parties are going to have to rebuild trust in some way. There's going to have to be a face-saving way for a boss to come back to the table because he promised to walk away if settlement construction uh, was, was uh, you know, started again. Uh, there's also a question of whether or not American uh, power is somehow diminished. There are a lot of folks in the region on the Palestinian side saying, we can't believe that the Americans weren't able to stop the Israelis from uh, starting construction again. And so this, uh, this is a kind of a two-step back step. And now George Mitchell is out there for the United States trying to make sure that the peace process doesn't come off the rails. All right. And now we're revisiting a subject we've talked about before on Flashpoints, and that's the tension between uh, Japan and China. What's the latest there? Well, you said we'd have to come back to China, and, and we are, and we're going to do it again. Uh, tension between Japan and China uh, because of the uh, seizure of a Japanese, or, excuse me, a Chinese trawler, a Chinese fisherman who was in custody. He's now been released. But what's uh, most important about this incident is that it revealed a number of tensions that are emerging in the region with China, and largely because China is flexing its muscles. China has claimed uh, predominance in the South China Sea. Uh, they are disputing uh, control over certain islands in the region. Uh, they, as part of this uh, conflict with Japan, decided to stop export of uh, rare earth minerals, which Japan needs for things like hybrid cars and uh, wind turbines. And so in some ways, uh, China has started to flex its muscles a bit. And the region, starting with Japan, is starting to chafe. And uh, it's creating a reaction and a ripple effect that I think China maybe didn't expect. And the key is what the reaction is going to be. I mean, that's what we have to watch for. How is Japan going to respond here? Well, that's absolutely right. And, and though the fisherman has been returned to China, the tension is still there. It's still simmering. Uh, and what you have are countries in the region starting to look, frankly, to the United States as a counterpoint to China. You have the Vietnamese cozying up to the United States. We talked about that last time. The Malaysians as well, uh, the Japanese and the South Koreans. And so, you know, I think that the Chinese have uh, sort of come out of the gates a little too early flexing their muscles because I think people are starting to see what that means and they don't like it necessarily. And so that means a potential advantage for the United States to be a, a counterweight to China, but also it means that the countries in the region are going to have to evaluate how they deal with China on things like the economy, trade, as well as military relations. Our next flashpoint actually is in New York where a terrorism trial is opening, a very important trial. This is one of the uh, accused embassy bombers uh, back in 1998, I believe. This is a guy named Kalani. Kalani. Ahmed Kalani, a Tanzanian East African Al Qaeda member who was a key part of the East African embassy plots back in 98, hitting the, our embassies in Dar es Salaam and Nairobi. Uh, he was captured in Pakistan in 2004, was in CIA custody, then transferred to Guantanamo in 2006. Uh, what's interesting about this case is that it's about to get underway. They're in jury selection right now. Uh, what's also interesting is this is the test case for the Obama administration. This is a case in which they've taken a Gitmo high-value al-Qaeda detainee, put him back into the criminal justice system in New York, uh, and it's a test case for both legal principles and politically whether or not uh, the Obama administration is going to be able to send al-Qaeda folks into the criminal justice system and try them effectively. Could be a dry run for maybe the trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and some other high-profile al-Qaeda. I think the Obama administration will want to portray this as, as just that. Uh, they've been very uh, lucky and, and good in terms of getting some good rulings 
out of the court in terms of the Speedy Trial Act not applying, in terms of prior detention not affecting the legitimacy of the trial in, the, in a civilian court. And so there's been some very good rulings for the government on this. And I think the Obama administration is going to want to see a successful prosecution and then use that politically to support some of its future decisions. And our last flashpoint is in Colombia, where I guess another FARC commander has been killed? Yeah, one of the chief uh, FARC commanders, in fact, the, the chief military commander of the Eastern Bloc, one of the longtime leaders of the FARC, uh, was killed recently uh, by Colombian military forces. Uh, this this is a gentleman by the name of Jose Briseño. That's his uh, military nom de guerre. He's also known uh, by the name of Mono Jojoy. Uh, this is a really bad guy. Uh, this is a guy who led a lot of the uh, kidnappings uh, that the FARC is notorious for. He was also part of the ring of FARC individuals who killed three Americans uh, who were down in Colombia helping the UWA Indians. It's a case I worked on when I was at the Justice Department. And so this guy has been on the radar screen for a long time. He's been a senior commander. And it's uh, the latest in the line of uh, leadership uh, killings or, or degradation that the FARC has suffered. And they really are in trouble now because you're seeing not only are the numbers dwindling for the FARC, their momentum is down, they're under a lot of pressure from the, from the Colombian government, and there are some hopes that uh, perhaps there, there's a, a negotiated settlement out of this, or at some point the Colombian government can actually crush the FARC uh, and make sure it's no longer a threat to their security. And finally today we go back to the news of the day, and that is th there are a lot of reports about some kind of nascent plot against European capitals that seems to be getting some, some traction. And this comes again from the Al-Qaeda Corps Command in the Afghan Pakistan region. Tell me what you know about this. Well, this is a very serious plot that counterterrorism authorities, not just in the U.S., but in Europe, are taking very seriously. Uh, what we know about it is this. Authorities think that there is an al-Qaeda central plot driven by the leadership in western Pakistan to hit European capitals, soft targets, in Mumbai-style attacks. That is, with commando teams of some sort to hit these soft targets, perhaps tourist sites, perhaps hotels. Uh, to be a coordinated attack coming from al-Qaeda. Um, we don't know much more than that, but we know that the, the attacks and the plots are being taken very seriously, and we've seen reflections of this in Europe with heightened security in Paris and in London uh, and concerns in Germany. And so this is a very real plot, still uh, unclear, still sort of organic and in information, uh, but authorities are very seriously uh, concerned about it. The intelligence people that we've talked to describe this as a plot that is credible, uh, but it lacks the specifics so that we don't really know what all the tentacles are, or how big it is, or, or how many operatives are in the field. Absolutely right. I think, uh, you know, counterterrorism authorities and intelligence officials are always hungry for details. And so they're sifting through all their intelligence now to try to find details of this plot. But what's interesting about this is this comes at a time of sort of heightened threat concerns generally from a global perspective from al-Qaeda, not just al-Qaeda core, but perhaps out of Yemen, Somalia, or North Africa. But then you also have some specifics, more so than, per than perhaps in prior periods. And so we know that Al-Qaeda is sending folks potentially to European capitals, trying to hit soft targets, uh, trying to do this in a way that's similar to Mumbai, so they're not focusing necessarily on airliners uh, as they've done in the past. And so this is more detail than counterterrorism officials sometimes do have. And so that's what's uh, concerning them. And that that's makes it worrisome. It's the worrisome. The fact that you have some details is worrisome. That's exactly right. But it also allows counterterrorism officials to take certain actions. That's why you've seen certain sites, metros, the Eiffel Tower, et cetera, uh, guarded uh, more carefully. Well, this is still a developing story. We'll have to keep an eye on this one, too. Absolutely. Juan, thanks again. Thank you, Bob.